try it again. I managed to go off my own uh, my own page, but hey, um, hopefully Instagram is going to last out the whole evening and not crash us on us again because that won't be too much fun. We're going to get a front. You have hopefully two special guests actually, but uh, we've got definitely one for you, um, and we'll get chatting through that. We've got quite a few questions, so we're going to mainly jump straight into that. Oh, <laughs> look at that! We're straight on. Straight in. Straight in. So we're gonna we're gonna go through a load of questions. But uh, how are we doing? Are we doing all right? Not bad, thank you. Good day. Busy day. Working. Working. Yeah. We have the First... same day off, don't we? So both. Oh yeah, we have we have admin Thursdays, don't we? Which is always great. <laughs> always <laughs> great. How's the new place going? Yeah, I love it. Um, I've been. What am I in now? My fourth fourth week. It's today. This week's like my first proper back-to-back busy busy week they've the kind of week. eased me in so uh i'm finding my flow but yeah it's lovely it's a big yeah. difference your everett flow your majesty flow i've got everything lined up like a <laughs> biomimetic obsessor <laughs> well we'll uh, we'll get to that in a bit no doubt but um for anyone that's you know doesn't know who you are or anything like that can you just give us a quick little introduction and, and why you want to talk about some biomimetics tonight <laughs> okay um so yeah, hi everyone, I'm Fran. I'm a dentist working in London. I've just moved into private practice in Holland Park about a month ago, but up until then I was in quite a busy mixed NHS private practice. Um, graduated 2013 from Sheffield. And yeah, last year in lockdown is when I kind of found biomimetics. I had obviously read all that time off and in our master's, I did a master's at Eastman in restorative. And we were given a list of all the recommended reading that I don't think anybody had the time to do when you're working <laughs> as well as doing it. So that's when I had the time last year. I started obsessively reading all these papers. I just started a work Instagram in the January and obviously went into lockdown, couldn't really post anything. So I started posting summaries of the papers I was reading um, tagging the authors and then one of the authors was David Alleman. He rang me on WhatsApp. I started, you know, fangirling as you do. <laughs> um, and he's like, okay, Fran, you're my kind of girl reading all these research papers. Come and do my course. And I was a bit reluctant because I was halfway through my dissertation. I was like, okay, can I, can I handle this? Conventional crown preps, yeah? Yeah, you just, uh, yeah. <laughs> you just don't say no to David. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then, yeah, got sucked down a rabbit hole. I'm addicted, obsessed with it now. Um, but yeah, it kind of, all of a sudden, everything I was reading kind of fitted in. And we touched on things in my master's and I touched on things way back, not knowing that they were biomimetic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, pulled everything together and that's kind of made me love my job more since. So it can only be a good thing. Yeah, and it's interesting to say, you know, you do the, you see these bits and bits and pieces around on Instagram as you do with all topics, but you take mm -hmm. a little bit and I say it's not until it all comes together that it starts to make a lot more sense. Yeah, all these um, weird anagram, um, acronyms. Oh, you love a good acronym, don't you? But um, <laughs> we'll get the plug and analogies. In and analogies. <laughs> So I know all of this, get the plug in now, because I've yeah. been and done Fran's course with Stu. Um, and I think Stu will quite happily admit that you're the brains of the outfit. I'm not sure Someone what that said makes to it. me uh, the other day, oh, you're, you're the brains and Stu, it's the beauty. I was like, oh, I don't mm. know if either of us will, <laughs> will enjoy that. But, um, but it's beauty or no, brawn, isn't it? Those are the two options. All beauty and might brawn. Be <laughs> Am I the brawn? <laughs> uh, maybe, no. maybe. Um, no, um, yeah. Yeah, so, and then that brings it all together on that. And obviously, we'll talk a little bit about the course at some point today. Oh, here he is. Stuart, which one are you? He's here. He's supposed um, to be working late. Are supposed to be working late, Stuart. Jeez. Um, <laughs> but no, obviously, we've got, the, we've got the course, and I've been there and done that, and it's fantastic, mm -hmm. guys. So make sure you do check Thank that you. out. Um, but as you say, it does bring everything together because it can be quite an unusual topic or seem quite unusual when you start off with it. Yeah. Um, but it does all work when it sort of comes together. Um, and as you said, you've gone really, really far down the rabbit hole because the mastership is, was it the year or? It was a year long. We had, um, I, I think it was 10, 10 intense weeks. And then we've had like one-on-one -on -one calls every so often since. 
but you're given 128 papers um, to work through. I'm slowly getting there. It's still, I mean, I finished, technically finished in September. I'm still reading. But then you get given, someone will have read this paper and they say, oh, have you read that one? And suddenly you're, this folder's getting bigger and bigger and you, you kind of have to know when to stop, you know. <laughs> yeah, 128 is just... a little bit much for me. I think I'd have to stop at about five. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a lot. We've got a load of questions that got sent in. So thanks everyone who did that. And if we have any more today, please put them in the comments or in the, the Q&A bit so we can really... Uh really grill fan tonight because uh, she's really looking forward oh, to that um well the first one and i guess one of the main things we're looking at doing sort of what people think of as biomimetic restorations is thinking mm -hmm. of things like onlays and whatnot the first thing people asked about was actually crack uh dissection um so do you want to talk a little bit about cracks and then we'll go down the line into you know various treatment yeah, modalities sure. and stuff like that so yeah crack teeth we see them every day cracked cusp or you've taken an old filling out and suddenly there's this huge, a big dent in the crack. Um, traditionally, you know, full coverage crown or even you see, you used to see a crack and be like, okay, root canal crown. Mm -hmm. It's taking, it's more engineering than dentistry, but um, if you imagine you had a crack in a bridge and again, this is the first analogy, there'll be loads. <laughs> um, you wouldn't just put like a bandage around that part of the, bridge that's cracked you dissect it back or even take out that whole portion put it back in again so you have to dissect the crack you have to remove the crack as far as you can to stop it flexing to stop it propagating obviously if it's very deep and you're near to the nerve you're going to stay more in the periphery to try and dissect it further there that's one of the acronyms P psc is peripheral seal zone which is the dentine periphery in the um, cavity prep or the prep yeah you dissect it as far as you feel comfortable there are um, measurements that you can use to try and help you so you know that you're not you're not too near and you're not going to perforate or come out the side of the tooth you dissect it and then you reinforce it or try and deflect the loads when you're uh, when that tooth is being bitten on to not allow that crack to flex more you're, you're kind of making the the forces absorbed and deflected from that area where you're worried about one of the things you can do is rib bond that i'm sure people have seen all over here mm -hmm. um other things is just very very small increments horizontal layers you're, you're trying to keep the stress off that area and deflect the forces from that area so that means you don't have to then start um putting a full coverage crown on especially if it's not bonded you're still you've then got a you've cored your tooth you've put a traditional crown on and yet your your crack is still flexing underneath um and yes if you if you were to root tree and then put a full coverage crown on oh wow the patient's not in any pain anymore but that's because the tooth's now dead so the aim is wherever you can keep the tooth alive dissect rib on you know um chemically retained indirect or direct if it's stress reduced mm -hmm. and well you said about your first your first acronym of the of the night the psz so just go into PSZ. that maybe a little bit you know in terms of because this is true for caries removal as well as as cracks yes. um so you know obviously it's going to change through the shape of the tooth you're going to be a mm -hmm. bit less uh excitable when you're getting down towards sort of edj because that's not very close at all but just talk us through that a little bit um both in terms of caries and, and cracks yeah so you might have seen cre which is caries removal endpoints or c little r RE, which is crack <laughs> removal endpoints. <laughs> There's a very, very good paper that, um, if you're going to read any paper, the first one to read in biomimetics is the Manier Alleman one from uh, 2012. And that, sh in my opinion, you can't really be using caries dye unless you've read that paper. They go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And using caries dye, um, I sound so dramatic when I say this. So you need to use caries dye if you're a dentist because we're dealing with decay and you need to know where the decay is. It's, you know, what does hard to probing mean? It's so subjective. We've got something that helps us visualize it. You use it, it's cheap, it takes 10 seconds. It's like 40 quid a bottle, lasts you. I've used mine every day, I've still not gone down a quarter. Shows you where the decay is. And then you use these measurements to remove the 
decayed dentine to maximum endpoints or the point at which you can't go any further because of fear of perforation. And that's what the, the endpoint is. And, and by perforation, you mean the pulp chamber? Pulp not, chamber, Not yeah. the vacation, hopefully. Well, hopefully they're not <laughs> that far down. There are endpoints for um, endodontically treated teeth that are slightly different to, to help prevent that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, the, the endpoints are using these measurements in that paper. So in a, in a nutshell, it's five millimeters from the occlusal surface or three millimeters from the marginal ridge of the adjacent tooth. Adjacent and that keeps you tooth. in a safety zone. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what that, that acronym is. They all slot together, so it's hard for me to stop talking. <laughs> we need like a little, we need a little crib sheet, don't we, for the end? I hope someone's taking some notes and working out what all the acronyms There's, are. There's, if I, I'm sure people follow Patrick Callahan. Um, oh yeah, Callahan yeah that's a great. He's post. got yeah, a yeah. Um, a post called Understanding Alimonies, and he's got them all there, <laughs> every single one. But there's more being added all the time, so people get acronym happy. No, I think the the Carey's die is like a really good point, as you say, like relatively it's easy to get hold of and, and use and and you find when you start using it for the first time you find so much stuff that you yeah, normally would be scary, like it's all it? it's always about on the you know the, on the even just like the enamel margin you think mm -hmm. looks absolutely fine and then you go and there's you've got nice yeah. little pink all the way up and you're thinking oh geez i would have thought I'd that say, was yeah, clean and anyone who starts using it just do your cavity prep and then and then test yourself and it's yeah. it's quite scary because <laughs> yeah. then you think about all the other fillings you did before Every single one. <laughs> and it can be useful with, with cracks as well. It's not, you know, like you're always going to show them up, but certainly when yeah, you're out of the periphery help. as well, it can be quite handy. Yeah, it can help. Um, often, often you'll think you've finished your cavity prep and you put one last application of Kyrie's dye and then you see this tiny line and you think, oh no, especially now with 7.5 loops on. So the best and the oh, worst. Oh yeah, you got those the other day. Oh, I have. <laughs> um, yeah, Carrie's like yeah. Everybody get it. Everybody use it. Yeah. There's no yeah. biomimetic dentistry without Carrie's dye. That's the first first step. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, well, the next we had a couple of questions in about materials coming up next. So, mm -hmm. well, you you guys always send the courses about going from the base. Up. Yeah. So let's do it in a base up kind of order. So the first thing people want to ask is always the age of question. One of our delegates. <laughs> I've done the course, it was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the first, first layer then we're gonna be looking at. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, I guess you could even go beyond that and start talking about a bit of etch, selective etch. Oh, that's in a whole different ooh, topic. So ooh. it depends what denting bonding system you're using. <laughs> some are self etch, some are total etch. Well, that's the next edge. question. Which bond? Which bond? Um, so Clearfill SE Protect is the best bond. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why. It's by Cura Ray. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get in the UK. We're trying our hardest. Unless the you've reason... got a contact in Europe somewhere. Yeah, we, there's like a, <laughs> a secret dental market, but um, <laughs> yeah, they... Cura tried to sell it in the UK. They paid 15 grand for a license a few years ago. Um, English dentists weren't as in the know as they are now. We didn't know why it was so good. They sold one system. So they're refusing to pay the license fee, understandably. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone's trying to put a petition together to show how many units they would sell now. Um, but yeah, it's it wasn't very profitable for them in that first year. So what is it about... SE Protect, SE Protect. it's so, so vital. It's a two bottle system. Mm -hmm. um, two bottle systems as a whole are better than single bottles. Um, we liken it to like three in one links hair body uh, wash to different products for different things. Um, you, need, you need control. So the first bottle, you know, you've got yourself, if, say it's SE Protect, it's self etch. It's acidic. Mm -hmm. Why would you want the acid hanging around when you're starting to bond? Um, there's little enzymes in the dentine called MMPs. They are activated by acid etching. Um, they're activated by acid in caries. So you want to switch those off. There's a monomer in both bottles of SE Protect called MDP, which switches those proteins off. And the reason it's important to switch them off 
is they are they they're kind of part of a defense mechanism of the natural tooth so they're there regardless of any decay but they're activated by acid and they degrade collagen in an attempt to try and help the tooth to survive in deep decay mm -hmm. but then we don't want them around when you're trying to bond that collagen or your bond is going to degrade and um, someone again the other day sent me some statistic on another paper that I've not read yet and mm. it was something crazy like um, over five years your bond at the base if they're not deactivated um, degrades by 30 percent they're quite a lot so you're in effect your tooth is um, destroying its own dentine bonding mm -hmm. so the monomer MDP in SE protect in both bottles switches these or deactivates these little enzymes off we think of them like pac-man it's just an and, it's, it's a, and it's a great slide in the course guys it's a great uh, slide. <laughs> sticks in everyone's so head the other one that obviously is sort of banded around quite a lot being like octibond and things like that mm -hmm. a lot of people like the octibond so what's the differences there and why is that what we think not quite as good or are there situations where it is as good or better yeah octibond fl um, is another good system. I use it a lot of the time. Um, you don't have anything in the two bottles that deactivates these MMPs. So I use it alongside pure chlorhexidine, um, not corsidil. You can get pure <laughs> stuff from Henshine. Or cordicil. So, or, or, yeah. <laughs> or Listerine. 2%, um, little bit on a uh, cotton or pledge it after etching and that deactivates them. But you really have to scrub it in for a good 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Optibond FL, slightly different to SC Protect um, in quite a few years. It has more ingredients. It's not as good because it's a total etch system at dealing with deeper decay. Mm -hmm. so if you've got something quite superficial or you're just bonding to enamel, Optimum Defel is a really good system. Um, as you, if you think about the tooth and the tubules and the dentine around the crown, if you think back to being a student learning Ooh. tooth anatomy and the tubules go around like a fan shape. This is where it gets quite complicated. It's like a whole, a whole morning of teaching, but I'm trying to simplify things without getting too um, confusing. As a student, I always used to think about um, dentine bonding as just resin running into the tubules. But if you think about in a deep lesion or cervically, those tubules are almost parallel. You're, you might have cut just between them. And it's that, I can never remember if it's intra or peritubular dentine. I'm pretty sure it's peri. But the dentine between the tubules is actually the more important part of dentine that we're bonding to. Mm -hmm. It's not got as much mineral content the further you get down the tooth. So if you were to use a total etch system and you just come in with um, acid etch, you're getting rid of all that last bit of um, mineral and collagen you're trying to hold on to and bond to. It's just, it washes it away and you've done too much. You've kind of over prepped it. So you've not got all that micromechanical chem and chemical retention left. Um, and also SE Protect has less less ingredients that um, annoy the pulp. So the further down you get, you want something that's less cytotoxic. So SE Protect, less cytotoxic. It doesn't have as many ingredients in that second bottle. Perfect. So everyone get on the emulate petition for uh, yeah, SE Protect. Yeah, please, if you message um, it, we have literally got a petition. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a joke, there's a genuine petition. It also um... makes uh, your dentine bonding that little bit simpler because there's, it's self-etch. There's no chlorhexidine involved. It's your two bottles. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Um, and then the next question and the next sort of layer up we had was about IDS. Mm -hmm. So that's another another nice acronym. So what's our IDS? IDS um, is a... What do we <laughs> use and what do we do it for? <laughs> I might ask you one of the questions at the end. Oh, no, no. no, 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 no that's not how I'll this works. You. That's not how this works. <laughs> <laughs> Um, IDS, immediate dentine sealing, as opposed to delayed dentine sealing. So most people use it in the context of when you're doing indirects, whether you're sealing your prep, the dentine, at the prep visit, immediate dentine sealing, or at the fit, delayed. It's your, it's your dentine bond, that's, that's what that is. All you're doing is sealing the dentine off. So 
you're helping with post-op sensitivity, uh, bacterial leakage, but you're also, it's about time and it goes hand in hand with decoupling with time, which is DWT. Mm -hmm. And this is so much to talk about, isn't there? My, so this, my, uh, one of my receptors actually, um, I had an <laughs> onlay fit that's coming in tomorrow and it mm -hmm. wasn't, and it wasn't back this morning. And, um, she was like, where, what's this new lab you're sending to, DWT? And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> she, she like flicked through the notes and just saw DWT and thought it was a new, uh, a new, uh, a new lab. We've had a couple of people asking, where's the link to the petition? So uh, you're going to have to put that, oh, uh, send, send add... it and we'll put it in okay. the description. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I love everyone's commitment to the cause. Commit, commitment to the bond. Yeah. Um, Anyway, DWT, it's not DWT. allowed. DWT, so <laughs> another dental myth, if you like, when we, or I was certainly taught, when you, when you cure your composite or cure your resin, it's shrinking towards the light. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely incorrect. I liken it almost to like when you were at school learning GCSE science and then suddenly you go to A-level and there's all this stuff. That's, so much more to the Krebs cycle, simplified, right? yeah. <laughs> so much more. Um, when you cure your composite, it, sh it shrinks or it, well, it doesn't really shrink, it flows. You have to think of it as like lots and lots of little monomers. And it flows to the most bondable surface or the mass of bulk that's already similar to itself. So in a cavity, it will flow to dentine. I'll say that why in a second, that's another thing. It will flow to dentine, or if there's already a composite layer there, it will flow onto the composite layer because that's the same as itself. Mm -hmm. When you cure, the flowing doesn't stop. So the denti, the composite and the resin are still flowing deeper into the composite layer below or the dentine below for time. Mm -hmm. And that's what that decoupling with time is. Decoupling just means that these monomers that are floating around are coupling up with each other, getting into oligomers and polymers and that's when you're, that's the strength, that's where the strength comes from. Um, dentine bonding, the bond to dentine is potentially stronger than enamel. And that's the whole premise of biomimetics, really. And once you understand that, it changes how you're prepping, it changes your cavity prep, because suddenly, you know, we're all taught about this enamel ring and holding onto that, because that's where the bond's coming from. Well, actually, there's a whole lot of dentine where you can get a better bond strength too. So immediate dentine sealing, you're doing your dentine bond at the prep stage or it's your first layer of your um, any direct. And then with time, it's getting stronger and stronger and you're allowing that resin or the composite to flow deeper into the hybrid layer and that's where the strength comes from. Mm -hmm. So then with your, your decoupling with time, mm -hmm. you're you're allowing that process to happen. You're allowing it, yes. Before putting more comps on, which could potentially disturb that and, and pull away. Exactly. So in, a, in an indirect case, you've got two weeks where that dentine sealing is, is flowing further and further, deeper, deeper into the tooth. It's helping post-op sensitivity. Since I started doing it, I've never had post-op sensitivity. You're trying to keep vi vitality, no leakage. If anyone ever did an onlay on my tooth, this, you know, it all makes sense. After five minutes, the dentine bonding, if you're leaving it, just that layer to help um, bed down further into the hybrid layer, your dentine bonding is increased by 90%. Mm -hmm. So if in, a, in a direct situation, I do my dentine sealing. I then do a resin coat layer. We can come onto that. And I would wait as long as possible in that appointment to then start doing the next steps because I know my dentine bonding layer is now 90% stronger after five minutes. Mm -hmm. And I would say that to my patient. They don't, you know, they don't mind. They've got rubber down on. If you're telling them I'm going to have five minutes here to make, uh, do my nose because it's going to be 90% stronger. I know it sounds strange. That's what I just say to them. They're like, oh, okay, carry on. Oh. <laughs> yeah. they, I think they're saying, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably crying inside, yeah. <laughs> but no, um, yeah. Resin coat layer, shall I quickly go into that? Yeah, so, so in Fine terms supply. of, yeah, with the IDS and resin coat, what are we using for that? So bond systems again, obviously, but then, you know, certain flowables, what are we using? I can see why it gets confusing. I've if, lost 
on this with all these words and things and materials on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Your IDS refers to just your dentine bonding system. Some people, if they're using Optibond FL, will say that they are happy to leave that out or use their bottle too, and that is their resin coat because Optibond FL bond has a much thicker. You, when you use it, you can feel it. It's very, it's very gloopy. It's, it creates a much thicker layer. That's the technical term in the literature, right? That it's gloopy, gloopy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gloopiness. Yeah, it's very viscous. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's very, it's much, it's much thicker layer on your bottle too on Optibondafel than other systems. So some people think, oh yeah, okay. Well, they might even add a, use that as their second. Mm -hmm. It's not as highly filled as a flowable composite, that, that second bond layer. And it's not as elastic. Mm -hmm. And going back into biomimetics, you're trying to match the properties of the tooth at different parts and different layers. And at the dent, uh, deep in a, in a tooth, it's quite elastic. You never think about teeth stretching or anything, but you don't want something too rigid at that layer. You want the tooth to move at the base. Mm -hmm. So then you bring in a flowable composite that has a similar matched elasticity to dentine, from deeper dentine, and a high, more highly filled material, so you've got the strength as well. And you would layer that over the dentine to increase your quality and I don't like saying thickness because it's not quite true that you want a thicker layer it's a it's a better quality layer mm -hmm. it's a bit like velcro again another analogy so you, you want to lock in so resin coating and IDS go hand in hand I, I don't do one or the other they're, they're they're a thing that work together and it's just then that the resin the highly filled resin in the flowable will go further down into the hybrid layer and lock in so it's like a a tighter lock at the dentine interface, the base of your uh, composite or your direct, indirect. We've just had a couple of questions here, so I'm just going to jump in quickly and do mm -hmm. those while we sort of polish that. Um, so we've got, it might be a trivial question, but how much does your workflow change, time, etc.? Also, would you bill for the rib on top? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, from my point of view, my workflow has obviously changed since I've done the course um, with the steps and whatnot, but Again, as I said earlier, I think I was doing the majority of it whilst not really completely it all coming together properly. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've changed, like, I don't, my prep time hasn't changed or, no, I don't think any of it's changed particularly. I think it's, I'm more aware of what I'm doing mm -hmm. and de definitely things like IDS. Yeah. It's actually, again, when you're doing it in that, in your five minutes and things like that, actually it doesn't necessarily take it's not always that you are sitting around for five minutes because you can be doing sort of other bits. I mean, involved. yeah, you can like uh, if you're doing a a class two cavity, you can start building up your interproximal wall while you're still letting that dentine layer mature. Yeah, there's little things you can be doing, or you know, often if you're doing a quadrant, you're you're kind of t you know working quite cleverly, so you're on the next tooth while the other one's maturing. You know, it's it's quite fun in that respect, jumping around. Um, workflow changes. It's like anything. If you start to you start to learn something new you're pre you're you know you get slower things yeah. are new but the thing i love about biomimetics is it's all protocol based and once you get into the swing of it and you're doing the same thing every time because you're wanting the same reproducibility mm -hmm. um and results predictability the more you do the quicker you you can go under certain steps and you know the ones that you can go that's slightly a bit quicker and then you've done your dentine and i um you know, IDS and resin coating, like, whoa, okay, I'm going to go slower now, take my time. It's knowing when you can, when you can in, um, increase your speed and when you need to pull back a little bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a, it's a steep learning curve at first, but then I don't, I, I don't book out much longer. I mean, I'm in private practice now, so my mm -hmm. appointments have gone longer anyway, but I don't, it didn't really change what I was booking in time-wise. And we're gonna, that's the that's a bit of the question, the question. Up, again a little bit later. Um, okay. And what well, charging for ribbond? Uh, yeah. Charging sure. for ribbond is is tricky. If you know you're going to use it, personally, I don't. Um, when I was in working in the mixed practice until about a month ago, I was I just took the view that I wanted to work a certain way. I was doing. I did ribbon cases on the NHS. I was I was doing what I thought was better for that tooth. 
it was helping me just get into this, this protocol. Um, it's hard. Sometimes you take a filling out, there's a huge crack and you've not told the patient. So are you going to tell them halfway through with their rubber dam on that, you know, you're putting an extra 50 pounds in? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's tricky or, you know, you get in and you think I can do this directly and then actually, whoa, no, you can't. You need to do an indirect. And there's a couple of cases that are tricky and I maybe I've stopped and I've done it direct and then said, you know, maybe we'll monitor this and we'll bring you back when it needs an indirect. It's, it's hard. Um, the other question from uh, Tristan was saying, biometric principles can be applied to many bond and composite systems. How much mm -hmm. of a gain is there from using the materials we mainly see in the literature? I think that's sort of going to come into one of our sort of closing out questions about yeah. how to maybe do this, as you said, in your sort of majority NHS or mix or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we'll save that for the end. Stuart's amazed that I do occasionally do a composite. Well, ever since I saw Stuart doing hands-on demonstrations, it's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so we always perfect. say um, poor tech or good techniques with poorer materials is better than um, awful technique with the perfect material because it's unless you're unless you know why you're using it and how it's going to work or you know why you're adding your resin coat or that it just needs to be contained to dentine it's the technique that overrides the materials but then when when you start reading the papers and the same materials are producing the the results that you're after you then you want to use those materials and it's it's not just what's in the drawer it's something carefully chosen because it matched certain properties and functions of that part of the tooth you're restoring mm -hmm. perfect wait stop <laughs> next layer we're talking about composites and someone asked about what is apx so there we go so you said you said already as you said there you want mimicking the, the various layers of the tooth and things like mm -hmm. that so You've done your resin coat, you're yeah. moving on now. So what, you know, you're looking at certain types of composites. Again, you're looking at, you know, similar properties to that sort of more central aerodentine. And yeah, mm -hmm. what is what is APX? That sounds like another acronym to me. <laughs> APX is another <laughs> acronym. It's, it's a composite by um, oh, Curare. Everything seems to be from Curare. Curare, GC, Voco. Um, Cure Array, it's a composite and it's one of the best matched for dentine properties. Mm -hmm. It's also really nice heated. It's one of the best things to cement um, an indirect or bonded onlay or overlay with because it mimics the dentine properties, strength and modulus of elasticity to so near. But yeah, Perfect. it's just a type of composite. And in terms of other composites, obviously we used a bit of, uh, we used the Everex flow. Mm -hmm. um, you got Everex posterior stuff as well. I really like using the Everex flow. Um, it handles yeah. really nicely, doesn't it? Me too. Um, but no, I think that's oh, it's all of our layers almost built up. So what other questions have we got? Obviously doing anything biomimetic, we're going to have a rubber dam on, right? Yeah, always. And something we haven't talked about uh, yet in terms of those other things was DME. And one of the questions was DME on the distal of the last standing tooth that you're clamping. Nightmare. when you're when you're running half an hour over <laughs> <laughs> and so, the patient can only open three three <laughs> millimeters yeah um they're always tricky there's a couple of cases on my instagram where i've used copper um, and i've kind of cut the copper to size and just just moved or just adjusted my clamp ever so slightly so then the copper is clipped by it so it's, it's tricky it depends on your patient and you know how comfortable you are with rubber dam the other thing you can use is a saddle clamp. Um, people might have seen those on Instagram. Incidental have started doing them. They're not a new thing. Um, they've been around ages, but it's just now there's these other things coming into play more and more like DME. It's, we've got these things to hand that actually work pretty well for them. And that comes with like a little peg. So you can, where it's attached to the tooth is much more mesial than where you're working. That works really nicely. It's It's whatever, you can you can work with the, the clamp obviously clamp choice mm -hmm. i like a w56 on those kind of cases if you can it's it's tricky on posteriors because of anatomy with the closing you know get stuck on but i've just lost the audio there i think that was a bit of a connection problem oh we're back there we go did you mute us 
You ran no, through. someone someone was <laughs> trying to join. <laughs> oh, I don't get that. Oh, nightmare. Um, um, but yeah, long, a long as bow, as long a bow as possible on a on your clamp. Give yourself some room, and maybe something that's a little bit more aggressive to get down a little bit lower, perhaps, so that it's easy yeah, to get something more festooned. In there. That's the word, isn't Ooh. it? It's such a good word. <laughs> Um, we just had a question there about copper, the copper band. So, any particular thicknesses, or you know, is there, um, yeah, um, yeah, is it certain things you can order? They tend to come. It's quite hold, um, tricky to get hold of. It's usually matte or shiny. The thickness is pretty much the same. I think it's about fifty microns. Um, it's not copper is very strong in thin section, but soft, so you can push it, and it doesn't mm -hmm. deform as you're pushing it down. So it cuts the the gingerly quite nicely, push it down, but it doesn't deform out of place like a paladin does. So it's mm. more it's more that than the the thickness. So uh, Gary the dentist says get those twenty twenty two dates sorted. What about the uh, October twenty twenty one date? Yeah, we've got I think we've got two spots left. That's twenty ninth and thirtieth of this month in London for posterior. Well, there you go get on that sort that out <laughs> um what's the other so the other bit actually we got asked there is then about the usual stuff that you see on instagram mm -hmm. on low preps and things like that the question yeah. was quite literally flat versus more retentive on low preps so what are you know design principles and, and things like that um so again it goes back to dentine bonding i very rarely do any full coverage mechanically retained preps anymore unless unless there's a failed traditional crown where you've got decay underneath and then you're having to replace it. Um, I just go for a bonded option like Emacs or composite after. But it's knowing that once you understand your dentine bonding is potentially stronger than enamel, I, try, I, I tend to let the biology um, take, lead me to how much I'm prepping. So by that, I mean, you know, you take out the filling or you take out the decay and whatever I'm left with, I will try and touch as minimally as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hate even chopping cusps off now. Um, the more I do, the more I kind of try to hold on to anything two or three millimeters thick. Mm -hmm. So I very rarely do anything like a shoulder or a chamfer. I like everything rounded because with Emacs particularly, you don't want sharp edges. Um, yeah, so rounded, ed rounded off no mechanical retention almost. I do a lot of what they call tabletop or like plate preps mm -hmm. because I'm so confident in the dentine bonding, but it is having to follow that protocol to make sure you've got that dentine strength. You can't suddenly do a tabletop and not be getting that strength. Otherwise they're not going to stay on. Yeah. Yeah. So, and as you say, it's then following those other, other steps already that you might be doing for mm -hmm. your indirects or your directs and, sort of building that sort of principle principle into it mm -hmm. um the other question that was related to on those was temporization obviously yeah. if you're doing something that's very unretentive um that's always the biggest stress particularly when you're going on holiday for the week in between mm -hmm. um any tips for for temporizing you're a poly f person i am a poly f i'm a shrink fit girl <laughs> okay yeah, i don't yeah. i hate temp bond mm -hmm. oh i just i make a mess of it still in my hands um yeah i would take a putty index either lab putty or um i've forgotten the name of the other one i used to use speedex okay take a, a putty first before i start prepping and then at the end uh polyethin straight over the tooth wait till it's almost fully cured i'll leave it on a bit longer you get used to how much to put in with however many on lays you're doing don't overfill it or you get have to do so much tidy up but the important thing is after your ids resin coat Cure and deglycerin, we do that anyway for the oxidin, um, oxidation layer. Otherwise, they, they get almost, they can almost slightly bond to the resin coat and they're a bugger to get mm -hmm. off. Your section, yeah. flicking, and I wait, you know, I've done it a few times, like, oh, my temperatures are just too good. <laughs> but it's, oh, and then you're putting your resin well. coat yeah. a bit, it's a bit of a nightmare. So, yeah, glycerin coat, um, most of the time you can, even with a very tabletop one, you can get them just just nicking into the interdental space ever so slightly. And if you're really worried about perio, you're quite deep, you could always, um, I've done it before, where I've put teepees in even, mm -hmm. or like teepees and then cut the handles off just to keep something there, or super floss, and then take them out once you've 
once you've got it set so they can TP between. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's shrink fit, I think, is, is a good way for retention on flat mm -hmm. ones. I like, I like a bit of poly. I want the, my one that yeah, I fitted me today too. had nice little, nice little layers. Very therapeutic. Just I've just seen um, Amos said, can we fix the petrol issue with Ribbond? Yes. Everything. <laughs> Everything will be fixed with Ribbond. Um, so then, well, we've got, we've got to our last sort of question, which we sort of already have touched on, which is mm -hmm. sort of, yeah, well, the, the wording of it wasn't exactly like, can we do biomimetic principles in the NHS? It was more, you know, I think the, the actual wording was, can we do it with, is it not necessarily, uh, similar to that question we asked earlier, no? can we yeah. do it with not necessarily those right materials? You know, what are the key things sort of that anyone could be doing, whether you've got SE Protect or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, are there any certain things that you think everyone could do yeah, to take, would... take home with? I sound like I work for Carrie's Dye, but definitely get some Carrie's Dye. It's only £40 pounds last year, year. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're not using a gold standard dentine bonding system, use chlorhexidine. No, odds are it doesn't have an MDP in it. So chlorhexidine scrubs after your etch if it's total etch. Um, IDS every time. Mm -hmm. When you're doing dentine sealing and your resin coat, just try and keep it away from the enamel. It's going to, you know, as we said, the resin and the composite want to flow to the most bondable surface. You need to trick it and keep it in, in um, dentine. If, you, if it's on the enamel, then you're getting it pulling into the dentine. It's just keeping those layers separate. This is uh, the problem with my 3.5s is now that I'm looking at, particularly our onlay prep. Yeah. Onlay prep and then trying to seal, seal dentine you there like... Need those yeah. fives, need those seven point fives. Need the seven point fives. I was I still feel a bit seasick when I'm in them. <laughs> <laughs> I've had them about six weeks. It's taking some getting used to, but it's great. Um layers a really a really easy way to restore a tooth um and keeping keeping the stress stress reduced composite is just do loads and loads and loads of thin horizontal layers for dentine replacement. Mm -hmm. um, you're making like a, say you've got an occlusal cavity, high C factor situation. We call it like a cup or a bowl prep. Suddenly you're making it into lots and lots of class ones because you've just got lots and lots and lots of little, um, like stacking up plates or pancakes. Mm -hmm. These analogies are amazing, aren't they? So then each layer is flowing down into the next one and the decoupling with time. Wait five minutes before you start putting extra layers on that IDS and uh, resin coat layer. And then you're, you're, you're essentially following all the techniques, as you say, but maybe not the materials, which comes mm -hmm. back to what, what you said earlier, which mm -hmm. is doing, using maybe not so good materials, but good techniques rather than yeah. I mean, having, all, having all the toys and, and not, not really using them properly. <laughs> all the gear and no idea. We all get addicted. All exactly. All the gear, no idea. It's better to have all the ideas and none of the gear and at least know you're using something deliberately and you know why. Read Absolutely. is another thing. Read, like you know, if you've oh, got some, you lost me there. <laughs> <laughs> if well, there's or Instagram, you know, if you've got, you know, you want to do a lovely non-retentive prep tomorrow. You know, we all follow these people. You, I'd be looking at Stephen Schiffenhouse's mm -hmm. page. You know, go and get somebody who you know you want to work like, and look at what they're doing. There's so much information on everyone's captions nowadays. It's free. It just takes. A little bit of time and effort, but at least you're more informed going in. Yeah. Um, so we've covered all the preloaded questions. If we've got any more questions, guys, please fire them in. Shall I see if our, our yeah, top see secret if our special guest is ready? Special guest is ready. They've tried to join twice. Oh, it's a not, bit of a time difference. Not to me. Hmm. Maybe I'm not able to. Let's Just see. while you're trying, Rupert, I'm going to um, answer away. Tom's question here. So, oh, look at you hosting. <laughs> where can we get SE Protect from? Um, we can't at the moment in the UK. You, yeah, we're trying. There are some dentists who have it who, you know, have travelled and brought it back with them. It's not that it, it's illegal to use here. It's just that the, um, the licensing hasn't been paid for. They don't want to. They don't want to pay for it. Yeah. Oh, here we go. I think we found it. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Hi. How you doing, friend? I'm not bad, thank you. How are you? Good to see you. 
Thanks for joining us. Thank you for coming on. This is the first I'll virtually in, uh, Glad <laughs> to have you, it. You can introduce. Host now, <laughs> the God has entered the room, according to Garrett the Dentist. So we've got <laughs> we've got David joining us, David Allman joining us, uh, which is very exciting. Um, we should change it to Franet Allman now that we've announced who, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> who it is. Um, so thank you for coming on to, uh, to talk to us. Um, so anyone that doesn't know you, which is crazy, and the number of viewers has just doubled, which is quite cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can we just have a little, a little intro from you, David, about uh, well, why you're one of the, the godfathers of biometadenture, I guess you'd say. Yeah, I uh, practiced traditional dentistry for 17 years, and I was frustrated with my results after immediate tra treatment of amalgams. Simple restorations were sensitive for a long time. And I would do a crown, it would have sensitivity, and then the sensitivity wouldn't go away with the clusal adjustment. I didn't know what was going on, and so it would go to endo. And then a few years later, the crown that it had end on treatment would break off and I would look at the crown and inside the crown we had the remaining two structure plus a buildup and uh, the fillings that were on the cycle of getting larger every five years and 10 years going to root canals and crowns. After 17 years, I was so frustrated with it. I quit dentistry. And uh, uh, at that time, my wife and I were the parents of seven children. So we didn't need to be employed. So, I mean, my, my kind of pastime was studying history, and I enrolled in some graduate history courses and was pursuing a degree. But at the same time, I understood that getting a PhD in history would be starting my uh, academic career over, and my beginning pay was going to be about $40,000 instead of 100000 I was making as a dentist. So, you know, my wife wasn't too happy about that, but <laughs> I guess she wanted to be, ha be happy. But her... Uh, her idea uh, actually to not quit dentistry came about because I heard about a uh, um, doctor named Ray Bertolotti who was teaching adhesive dentistry. And I didn't know exactly what that was, but it had the potential I understood to uh, seal a tooth and stop the sensitivity underneath a filling or a crown. And, and, and what uh, time period are we talking this about? This is here? 1995, January 1995. So in January 1995, uh, a little before I heard from a, a dentist friend of mine about this new technique of adhesive dentistry, um, it was a two-day course in Southern California. I was uh, in Utah at that time. I grew up in Southern California, so snow in January and February for me never has been really my favorite. So I was thinking, what the heck, you know, I spend a few hundred dollars, I get a couple of days in Huntington Beach, California, nice and sunny. I have nothing to lose, right? So I I got on a plane, took two days of adhesive dental training, and of course in 1995, it was just really the beginning of advances in adhesive dentistry. The only really good adhesive bonding systems had only come out in 1989, and uh, in 1995, 8, 1989, Albon II came out from Bisco, and that was a, a quantum leap uh, ahead of any other bonding systems that were made around the world. From 1989, 1995, it was the leader, but it had some real drawbacks in that it was a uh, acetone-based system, and you had to do what's called a moist bonding uh, protocol to keep the dentin from collapsing after total etching. Anyway, so it was really technique sensitive. And then 1995, a better system of total etch, three-step uh, bonding system called Optibon FL came out. And that was invented by Kerr Company. The chemist who invented that was named Al Kobashigawa. And the chemistry uh, was superior. It was not ethanol-based, but ethanol. I mean, it was not acetone-based. It was ethanol-based. And it had a monomer that had been invented actually the year I was born in 1951 by a Swiss chemist named Oscar Hager by a sold by a British company. Uh, the name of the material was Sabaton, but uh, it was a terrible restorative material used polymethyl methacrylate for the filling material had seven to eight percent shrinkage. You know, you never had any type of chance of having it work, but it had a molecule that was invented from the chemistry that 
was invented by Castan in 1937 for epoxy resin. And epoxies, of course, polymerize, and they polymerize with a, uh, a free radical polymerization. And so uh, Oscar Hager, hired by this dental company, of course, nobody knew what they were doing, but they did invent this molecule called GPDM that polymerized even in a moist surface. So it had what's called a bipolar structure in that part of the molecule was okay with water and part of, part of the molecule was okay with hydrophobic materials like polymethyl methacrylate. Well, that's part of the history, but <laughs> it had a bond because they had a contamination of nitric acid. They didn't know they had this contamination of nitric acid when they produced the GPDM. It was just a mistake. But it did etch the dentin, self-etch, and then it allowed this polymerization to bond to a certain level of about two to three megapascals, very weak bond, but it did bond to dentin. So that's why they said, okay, this is a bonding to dentin. Well, this Alkobashigawa in the 90s, you know, this is like 40 years later, just is going through a patent search because Kerr says we need to have an adhesive to compete with um, all bond two. Anyway, he came up with a formula using the GPDM and he had an acetone base and then they were doing acid etching for conditioning the dentin. Um, and so they didn't have to worry about smear layers and things like that, that the earlier systems from 1951 to 1985 really never had good bonding systems. They were all terrible. And I was a dentist since 78. So I had used several of the ones that were made by Scotch bond, particularly and they're just terrible. Well, <laughs> bottom line, fast forward to 1995, I get an introduction to adhesive dentistry, and they're talking about a company I'd never heard of. It's called Kurare from Japan, and Kurare uh, was uh, selling these adhesives. Now, most of the doctors interested in adhesive dentistry in 1995 wanted to do one thing and learn how to bond veneers instead of doing full coverage crowns anteriorly. So Ray Bertolotti's specialty was to teach dentists how to do conservative veneer preps and bonding thin layers of ceramic to mostly enamel, but sometimes dentin. And so my feeling was 80% of the teeth that I was treating in my office were posterior teeth. What I wanted to do is learn something about how to be more conservative on back teeth anyway, I got a bibliography from Ray Bertolotti, started to do a research um, investigation, which basically hasn't stopped till today. So basically for 30, uh, how many years is that? It's like uh, 35 years, 36 years. I've been reading dental literature every day for 36 years. It's crazy. It's a disease. So very few people have this disease. But it's addictive. The, I yeah, think you've Daphine, given it to Fran. I think like I think Fran. Fran, Fran has it. Dafina, <laughs> Dafina Doberdoli, Doberdoli, who works here in our office in our teaching center, has it. You know, a lot of the masters have it. Obviously, my son has uh, has uh, mastered the literature. Uh, but this literature approach, my dad was a PhD in physics, so he designed nuclear submarine sonar systems. So he was no average intellect. And out of five kids, I was probably the dumbest one. And so they thought, well, he's good with his hands. He's artistic. He's good with people. He's kind of political. Maybe he could be a dentist. You know? I mean, seriously, I'm the youngest of five. The top, the oldest two went on to mathematics as their career. Oldest brother was a linguist, spoke about 10 languages, read about 20 languages. But he went to Caltech, studied mathematics, took physics from Murray Gell-Mann and you know, all kinds of uh, Feinstein, Feynman, sorry, Feynman. Anyway, so took chemistry We've got some from other Linus. Here. We've got German yeah, here as well. he, he, took, uh, <laughs> he took chemistry from Linus Pauling. I mean, my brother was much smarter than me in that, but he wasn't good with his hands. He wasn't good with people. I mean, you know, we each have different personalities. But the bottom line, I ended up going into dentistry because my dad's cousin had a son who was uh, – in dental school at University of Southern California. I got to know him while I was in high school. 
And I just kind of thought that dentistry might be good. So I did dentistry, and uh, but I'm getting into the story because my dad would read <laughs> physical journals. And these physical journals would have diagrams, they'd have equations, and they'd have footnotes. And, you know, I'm a kid. I'm just looking at these things, and I'm going, how can you read this stuff? This is all, you know, boring, no colors, no illustration. But obviously my dad was paying our bills, and uh, and uh, and then I – became a senior in high school and had to take physics. You know, I got B's in all my chem, all my math classes and chemistry, but physics, it was the hardest one. And so I would ask my dad a question like, what's an erg or what's a jewel or what's a dime. And he would, (laughs) he would just spit it off the top of his head. And it was like, I was reading it out of my book. I had no clue what the book was saying. I had no clue what my dad was saying, but he would just look at me kind of that like. sounds familiar. He would, he would raise <laughs> his eyebrows and just say, this is a direct quote from my father, the best thing that he ever taught me. He taught me many good things, a great man. But he would just look at me and say, look it up. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun to me when I did her course. <laughs> So this this idea of looking things up, and then I did have some history classes in high school that were advanced placement history. We got the idea of a bibliography and having uh, writing uh, reports based on published science. Anyway, it's it's a long story, but when I come in, came in contact with Bertolotti in '95, he gave me a bibliography, and I said, "Okay, I'm going to start looking these things up." And there's a good library at USC. I uh, got some copies there. Another library was at Ultradent uh, Dental Products, actually about 10 minutes away from my house. So I used that library for about 10 years, and it was a good research library. And I made copies for myself of about 400 articles, and I went through those carefully, and they were the foundation. And once I had 400 articles, I could see the problems. If you leave decay in a preparation, you're going to have problems. If you leave a crack in Tadentin, you're going to have problems. If a gap develops because of polymerization shrinkage, you're going to have problems. And then the other ideas of how do you, uh, you know, make an onlay, uh, what are the advantages of a semi-direct technique and occlusion, all those kind of things. Well, I formulated these into a practice pattern in my office that I used from 1995 to 2000. Totally had improvements in all of my problems and I you know after five years of not doing crowns and not having sensitivity or teeth going to endo and uh, I my patients loved it Uh, you know there were some patients who were depending on um, insurance payments and that became and still is a problem in the United States where insurance will pay to mutilate a tooth and to cut all of its enamel off, but they won't pay you to save the uh, 80, 90, 50% of the tooth, 70% of the tooth that's destroyed with traditional techniques. But anyway, I lost half my patients, but they were pretty much the patients that weren't really exciting. They weren't good patients to me because they, <laughs> they would do what the insurance says instead of what the doctor said, and I felt like I knew better what was good for a tooth than than an insurance company. Uh, But as I practiced this way, um, dentists were interested and I I started teaching in uh, 2003. So after eight years of practicing this six lessons approach, which I I called it, um, and I coined the phrase, get bonded, stay bonded in 2003. That's always been part of the advertising of the course. I've been teaching it ever since 2003. But, you know, it's not easy to run a business. It's not easy to give up a private practice to start teaching. In other words, you can't make money fixing teeth if you're teaching other doctors how to fix teeth. You have to make money from the doctors who are fixing teeth. But to have any credibility, to have any credibility, you have to fix teeth. I mean, you know, every dental school is filled with dentists who teach dentists how to do uh, students how to do dentistry that have, haven't fixed a tooth for decades. It's a scandal, but in the United States, it happens all the time. 
So in terms of the the course, for people that don't know, we've got a few. I said we've got quite a few now. We've got German on um, Stuart's here as well. We might have to get Stuart. Nice, but, uh, nice. What's the, what's the sort of the mastership and things given? Yeah, the mastership. So yeah, so uh, basically, I taught a program called Six Lessons, which was a two three day training programs. So you'd get to a first level at three days, and then you'd come back after practicing the techniques for uh, a month or so, and take another three days of the same material. It's just a review. And then those six days of training were based on 27 articles that covered six topics. Removal of decay, uh, bonding, uh, uh, removal of cracks, bonding to dentin, uh, the dairy techniques of immediate dentin sealing, resin coating, deep margin elevation, how to do a stress-reduced direct composite with and without fiber, and so all of those uh, published articles that were public that were uh, available in 2003, uh, we've had expanded research on all of those topics that have confirmed what my initial uh, literature review uh, said, and that is complete caries removal is contraindicated. Uh, cracks into dent will always cause pain and need to be removed if they can without exposing the pulp, and immediate dent and sealing. Uh, with a gold standard bonding system uh, has to be accompanied with a thickness of adhesive resin that's called resin coating to stop uh, problems with transudation and air inhibition. And then the lesson four, which Fran will smile about, uh, <laughs> we've just, one. yeah, we've just, uh, we've just finished our uh, uh, eighth group. Uh, through lesson three. So our eighth group, so we've trained about 200 doctors the last two years with this more advanced in-depth literature review with the hope of training doctors to train other doctors like Fran and Stewart are doing mm -hmm. and uh, like Sam Sharif and German are doing. Uh, but this more advanced uh, training, I was only interested in doing this. I was retired for a couple of years after age 65 uh, because I'd been teaching... Uh, um, since basically for 15, 16 years and had some success. We've trained several hundred doctors and I had a partner in Italy, Simone Della Perry, and we would train hands-on courses there uh, in groups of six to 10. And they were very productive and the doctors who learned the techniques um, were able to implement them. But we, we came to the conclusion that it takes a minimum of three days to uh, train in the techniques. Now, most introductory courses like Fran and Stewart's are gonna be two days but of course, this is like, we'll teach you this, but you're going to need more. I mean, to be honest, you, you have to going to have to come back another two days, and and uh, and then you have some abilities to even go more in different uh, techniques. But we we've designed this new program in a way that we only are really interested in training doctors who are really serious about doing it uh, to the highest level. Uh, and, but, you know, it's a mixed blessing because my daughter, when she lured me out of retirement, mm -hmm. you know, it was always with fame and fortune, you know, you're going to be famous, dad, you're going to make a lot of money, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, she's right. And so we are making money and we are famous in Instagram. But the downside <laughs> of it is that we've got 25,000 dentists around the world that are trying at some level to be introduced to biomag dentistry through the university of Instagram and Instagram university is no more than an introduction. Yeah. Uh, you really have to have a mentor. In other words, if you have a problem, you need to have somebody to contact to solve that problem. Ideally that would happen in dental school. There is one dental school that is biomimetic and that's university of Geneva in Switzerland. They don't use the term biomimetic for some pretty stupid political reasons, but they call it bioesthetics. But it's an advanced adhesive dentistry. When I started teaching in 2003, I called the program Six Lessons, the Modern Fundamentals of Advanced Adhesive Dentistry. And then later on, uh, when I started to hang out with Pascal Magne and we decided to do some conferences, the first international conference on biomimetic dentistry uh, was done in uh, 2011 in Southern California, 10 years ago. And then since then, there's been at least one biomimetic conference 
uh, by the Academy of Biomedic Dentistry for 10 years and other conferences, uh, particularly Karma. Did you, were you able to see Karma last year, Rupert? Did you see that presentation? Nope. Yeah, so I'll Karma. Need, catch it. Yeah, so Karma was organized last year, a biomedic conference by three of the first uh, mastership trained doctors uh, in, the, uh, in Europe. And then we had video conference. Pascal Magni spoke. I spoke. Junji Tagami spoke. Uh, Davy spoke. Uh, Mark Fratter spoke. We had some real great presentations on biomedic topics. Jorge Aravena Diaz spoke. This year in December, there'll be another group. Uh, I'll be speaking again. Tagami will be speaking again. Sema Belli will be speaking again. Francesca Vailatti will be speaking again. Pascal Magni, Didier Dici. You know, Davey will be speaking again. So it's a group of 15 speakers, and you get to listen to their uh, one-hour presentations as many times as you want for one month. And the fee was, I think, 400 euros, maybe a little bit less. Uh, but the idea is it was a great introduction and a good review for doctors like Fran and Stewart that have already been trained. But again, the difference between introducing in a concept and mastering a concept is it's huge. It's just like how many golfers are there, but how many golfers, you know, play to the level of scratch where they can compete, you know, with top uh, top amateur tournaments. You know, my son Davey can. I never got to that level. I was good in my group, but I never am as good as Davey. So we call Davey number one. I'm number two. You know, so he's the best dentist in the world. You know, it's like, you know, you got to keep thing. But when, you're, when your kids take over and tell you what to do, sometimes it's the right thing. And Davey and my daughter, Hillary, you know, they have a third of the business with myself and my wife. And so, you know, we've been doing this successfully two years, and uh, we're very excited about continuing it. But we're really excited about the other doctors that are being trained by the masters that we've already trained. And that explosion of uh, training in the Philippines, uh, in Chile, in Brazil, in Europe, uh, in the United States, teaching centers like Bard uh, from Steve Schiffenhaus and Disking mm -hmm. Queen up in Seattle. You know, anybody who, you know, wants to uh, put their, you know, their hat out and say, I'm ready to, to teach, the market will soon, t soon tell you if, if you're ready. You know, if there's no, no dentists that are interested in doing better dentistry, uh, and they think they were taught to the highest level in dental school. Well, it's a free world, hopefully, for a while longer. You know, you can make those decisions. But, you know, I actually had some experience in the dentistry in the UK when I was a junior in high school. I was selected as a whatever outstanding representative of America to go to England for a summer. So for... Uh, so for three months, I was in the UK, and I lived with a dentist in South Wales who loved oral surgery and was extracting teeth left and right. <laughs> and I didn't know what a clearance was. Hopefully, I never <laughs> had, you know. But, you know, Dr. Parsons, again, he's a good guy. You know, he's passed away, of course, now. He has a son who's a dentist in Australia that I've lost contact with. But the idea I saw in England you know, people on the evening news that be list, you know, missing their reporter and they're missing number seven or a sports reporter would be, I mean, this is, you know, lateral incisor or central incisor on the bottom. And these guys are like, you know, they look like normal news or uh, television broadcasters, but they don't have teeth in the front. I'm going, <laughs> what? We've got I a little mean, better at that now. I think. Yes. Yeah, I'm <laughs> much better. But in, in 1968, it was a shock to this, you know, I wanted to be a dentist, and they had me live with this family who uh, the dentist was the father. Because of that, they tried to line you up with had s similar interests. But you know, as a as a junior in high school, it was like, well, all dentistry isn't the same. All you know, ideas are are different. I had no idea, you know, what I was getting into. But you know, I got into dental school, University of Pacific, and. Then I went in the Navy for three years. And in the Navy, we just did, you know, amalgams in the back and composites on the front teeth. And uh, then the prosthodontist did crowns and the endodontist did root canals and periodontist did perio and all that normal stuff. But then when I got into my own practice and started to see the realities, um, 
you know, for the first 10 years, everything that I was replacing, my assumption was the dentist didn't do it right. So now I'm fixing the problem that could have been prevented if it would have been done right. And then 10 years to the day, all of the teeth that I had done 10 years ago were having the exact same problems of all the teeth that I started replacing 10 years before. And it dawned on me like, I'm no better than anybody else, that's for <laughs> sure. And I didn't really like it. I, you know, I took a lot of endo courses about that time, and that introduced me to a microscope. And uh, one of my classmates, if you have any endodontists that you know, if you say the name Steve Buchanan, Steve Buchanan is probably well known in England also, but in the United States, he revolutionized endodontic treatment uh, with the nickel titanium rotary instruments that Ben Johnson uh, started. And then Buchanan and his partner Cliff Ruddle did a lot of teaching of uh, general dentists to do uh, mechanically instrumented endo. And, you know, I was doing that. But then when 1995 came along and this uh, idea of sealing the tooth, and sealing out bacteria. My undergraduate um, major was microbiology. So I've been, you know, very aware of how small bacteria are, and that they're ubiquitous, mm -hmm. and that if they're in the wrong place, they do bad things in the human body. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of uh, infection under restorations being potentially uh, prevented with this adhesive dentistry appealed strongly to what I knew about the biology of the pulp and the human system. And so that was my, I called my wife up after two days of training. I said, this guy, I don't know if he's smoking dope or what, but it's like, he might, you know, if he, he's got two doctors, he's got a PhD after his name, Ray Bertolotti. Before he went to dental school, he was making nuclear weapons for Sandia. He had a PhD in ceramic engineering. So he wasn't, you know, he was a, He's a bright guy, but his information on adhesive dentistry came from Fusiyama, and Fusiyama was a pioneer, but Fusiyama didn't have a lot of things figured out. And I, I told my wife, I said, I don't know. This seems promising, and if half of what I have learned these two days is correct, then it should change everything. And in reality, about half of what I learned was um, going in the right direction, but the half that I didn't learn wasn't really available because the literature hadn't been um, put together. Uh, and the first person who really did what I had done, in my view, was Simone Della Perry. And Simone Della Perry published his landmark article with Dave Bardwell in 2002 in the Journal of the American Dental Association. But his stress-reduced direct composite technique was more time-consuming uh, than just doing a crown and let the, the consequence happen. So he really didn't become popular, although he's given a lecture at Tufts University where he did his postdoctoral um, time. Uh, Simone Della Perry, his technique, everyone that's learned it, and now that we do it with fiber, we call it the wallpapering technique. We basically have no failures, no reinfections reported to any of the initial uh, placements of our immediate dentin sealing and resin coating and creation of what we call the bio base, which is the dentin replacement. So if you do 10,000 restorations and none of your dentin uh, adhesion fails and you have some chips on enamel and you can repair those chips on enamel with air abrasion and a very simple procedure without um, numbing a patient up, you know, life is good. I mean, you know, how how easy is your practice is if the only thing you have to deal with is bonding to enamel. And that's basically what biomimetic dentistry does. It sets up a scenario that in the future, under functional stresses, if something chips, it will chip in a repairable way that does not go into dentin. And so that's called a, a secure bond strategy or a fail-safe strategy. So, you know, all these things that, you know, friends – you know, nodding her head out, but you know, it takes eight, it. It takes nine weeks of you know one to two hours. The, the lecture three that we gave yesterday was two hours because we we've, we've put they a few more go. things in it. But <laughs> we always go over. Yeah, we say sixty minutes plus questions, but now it's more like oh, hour yeah. and a half of lecture plus. But the doctors in the mastership get access to those videos for 
12 months or maybe forever. We used to say 12 months, but we have a platform now that's called Kajabi. Fran, have you gotten onto that Kajabi yeah. platform? Now? It's yeah. unbelievable. And it it's can great. keep everything going. And of course my daughter, Hillary has a full-time assistant. You know, we have about 10 people working in the company. It's a business that is working well and has potential to growth. But the most important thing is we want to keep the quality so that everybody that we train is like Fran Brailsworth. And, you know, Fran, you know, I, we have a nickname for her. We call oh, her Holly, <laughs> you know, so, you know, if you, if the, if you have, you know, intrinsic beauty, that doesn't hurt when you're making a case for come listen to my course. Yeah, and uh, Stuart Beggs isn't, isn't hard to look at either. I think, the, you know, speaking, the, uh, speaking of which, let's see if, uh, let's see, let's if, see if he's free. That. But we were, I, I mean, I described, uh, I described Fran of the brains, the operation. So are we saying that Stuart's the beauty? So, uh... yeah. It's... Oh, I don't know if I'm offended or not. There you go. It's... <laughs> well, the one thing that is kind of important, and, and if the listeners haven't been listening oh, to us. Oh, I'm here. Stuart, how you doing? Good to see yep, you. Good you. We, we, we do want to, um, kind of clear the the dentists who listen that you know you see somebody like Stuart Beggs interior aesthetics you know and and it's just beautiful stuff and you know there's a I mean cosmetic dentistry has been you know talked about for 30 years in the United States and basically every dentist is a cosmetic dentist and blah 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 but in in the world of biomedics we don't really talk too much about aesthetics. Um, we figure you can figure that out on your own with good direction from people like Stuart. But the real problems of dental retreatment and, and dental failures are on back teeth for a number of reasons. The first one is that the occlusal forces on the back stress your restoration in the tooth 10 times as much as they do on the front. So you don't have cracks into dentin on anterior teeth like you do on posterior teeth. And you don't have stresses of the bond on anterior teeth like you have on posterior teeth. And so the, the, the main emphasis on biomedic reconstruction is having a tooth sealed top to bottom, side to side, and front to back. But the cavity configurations of back teeth are always very complex and they have to be evaluated in terms of how much tooth structure you have remaining. So what we call that is a lesson two analysis of structure, and that gives us a risk assessment for the, the uh, cavities uh, decay and fracture to occur. And so, you know, all of this emphasis on back teeth and not an emphasis on front teeth is something that should become very apparent when you start following some of the masters that we've trained on Instagram. And right now we have about two dozen very active masters out of the 200 that we've trained the last two years that are posting uh, regularly. And cases come up every day that are just outstanding. And uh, people who follow me or follow Davey, follow Fran, follow Stuart, they'll pretty soon start at following Patrick Callalang and they'll start <laughs> following Ashley Lifts and they'll start following Raphael Wayman and they'll start following Philip Kulamans and they'll start following Hugh Byrne. I mean, the number of really outstanding uh, restorative dentists that we have in the network, it's just, it humbles me to just be, uh, you know, part of their network because, you know, I just did a tooth today and it's just like everybody that would see it, deep occlusal decay, uh, normal uh, tactile visual uh, carries removal endpoint would have exposed the pulp, and this is on a 20 year old. And but a, if you're able to not expose the pulp, then the science says the tooth has a much better chance of surviving. And so now with uh, what's called the peripheral seal zone, selective carries removal, air abrasion, using a gold standard bonding system for immediate dent and sealing, resin coating fiber replacement in the first millimeter, decoupling with time, and a stress-reduced direct composite top, this tooth is, like, fixed permanently. <laughs> it's like this 20-year-old <laughs> doesn't have to go to the endodontist today or tomorrow or this week, and it's like, this tooth is going to be okay. But, you know, what's that worth 
you know, to a patient to not have to, you know, embark on uh, this cycle of retreatment. Uh, it's worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, to me, I'm just happy to be able to fix a tooth the right way. That's, that's what biomimetics is. Yeah, I agree. That's what I've, I think, taken most away from doing the mastership is that I know the protocols and what to do. And I'm confident that it's going to work and it has worked. Yeah. Doing them. Yeah. So, I mean, the first doctor that I trained, I play golf with him every Friday, <laughs> uh, you know, for 20 years. You know, he's been doing it for 20 years. So he's got cases, you know, 20 years old in a regular practice. I've got cases over 20 years old, but not as many as he does because I've been trying to recruit doctors to train them and, you know, I haven't been in the office uh, as regularly until my son Davey came out of the Army, the Navy, I mean, the Army Dental Corps uh, over th two years ago. So he's been teaching with me for two years, but, you know, he's been doing biomedics in the Army for four years and he was only doing it in dental school for four years and the faculty at dental school really didn't understand what he was doing. There was a couple of more progressive faculty members, but, you know, Davey just refused to do amalgams, refused to do crowns, and did uh, refuse to put liners in bases because they're not biomimetic. You don't need a liner or a base. You just need to bond. Even if you have a pulp exposure, which you shouldn't, if you follow the, the protocols that we published in 2012, but any, the bottom line is that Davey, you know, didn't take any crap from anybody at dental school. He didn't take any crap from anybody in the Army. You know, he didn't get kicked out of any, you know, dental school or Army situations. But he had some very serious discussions with people who were supposed to be his leader, you know, who had master's degree in operative dentistry or telling him to do amalgams and telling him to put bases in and, you know, telling him to ignore cracks. And, I mean... You know, Davy just doesn't put up with that. So, you know, if there's science that supports what you do and everything else is just a traditional that was tradition that was based on anecdotal evidence that started 200 years ago, you know, it's like to use, you know, Pierre Fichard's ideas about amalgam being bacteriostatic. Well, yeah, okay. You know, you can kill bacteria with mercury but it also kind of kills brain cells it's probably not too good for the not i mean probably the the patients are probably the least susceptible to craziness from mercury but you know in alice in wonderland the mad hatter is mad because hats were made with mercury did you guys know that they used to they used to polish them with mercury yeah well the idea is that they would have these felt hats and then they would put a ball of mercury, you know, a mass of mercury into the hat because it had a perfect, you know, it would, it would settle into this perfect yeah. curve. And so then the felt would stretch and get this permanent shape. But total, you know, mercury evaporation into the hatter's life made him crazy. <laughs> Well, we've mentioned Stuart's anterior stuff there, and Stuart's our second guest, because I believe, I'm going for it, I believe Stuart, yeah. uh, Stuart <laughs> kind of got a special announcement to make, which is very exciting. Do you want to go for it, Stu? Um, um, yes, yeah, so we're, um, we've actually had a lot of interest in a lot of people asking for this, so we're going to be doing a genetic book focusing on anterior restorations, to so putting all the principles into how to do sort of aesthetic bonding as well build things and then also like endo cores using ribble uh, nice using mm -hmm. so um we're launching that tonight great tonight. so there we go we got an exclusive uh, got an exclusive that will so, be in february yeah be in february. actually yeah. already booked up yeah we've got a third gone <laughs> all right which is crazy well we we encourage all your listeners to uh get trained by masters because that's how you'll you'll learn the the protocols and so i i'm going to sign off now but so it's been great good time. great talking to you and nice until next time you. get bonded stay bonded yeah, always good that. to talk to you okay <laughs> bye bye Cheers, David. bye 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 oh hey oh now i've got the dream team perfect guys well that's very exciting isn't it so anterior composite course with begs yeah. and uh begs and brosford oh, like uh, <laughs> <laughs>
But yeah, two more spots in on our posterior one at the end of this month. Yeah, so let's get let's get that plug in. So yeah, two more yes. spots. Go and Am do I it, guys. I'm having a bit of a break over Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and yeah, it's one of those, it's the cliches when you do a course, but it genuinely did change the way I went back to work the next day uh, or day after. But um, <laughs> absolutely go and do it. Uh, if you want to catch up, because we've still got a load of people who probably weren't here at the start, that's great. But catch up on loads of stuff. Fran's going to it in great detail. Any last questions, guys, pop them in. Uh, oh, I need to ask Fran the special last question. What's the, the one thing? I didn't prep about this before, did I? Oh, no. um, what's the one thing? <laughs> you could have warned us, you. Uh, what's the one thing that you, know, you do now or you know now that you wish you were doing a bit earlier and you can't say Carrie's diet? Um, it's a tricky question. <laughs> Ooh, one thing. One. I think I'd say, I th well, everything changed my, my whole you know, job and everything has changed since I started talking more to the dentists and networking. And mm -hmm. I used to be really scared of it. I, I was really apprehensive to join Instagram. And then, you know, I join Instagram, suddenly I'm on David Allen's course. So I would say, find a mentor. That would mm -hmm. be my, or as many as you can. If you're mm -hmm. interested in a certain subject, go to who you think is really good, see how they trained. And if, just don't be scared of messaging people, you know, I message people right at the top and they're just so humble and they message straight back that would mm -hmm. be my advice perfect uh question there straight off so can we please get a link to the courses any info on courses i'm guessing it's going to be on your guys pages bios all that jazz yeah there's there's a link for um information about the course and the posterior and anterior booking links on both mine and stuart's bios Lincoln bio. <laughs> and uh, Am Amos being very kind and said he's got three mentors and they're all on here. So there we go. Oh, uh, I thought you're the best. <laughs> um, perfect, guys. Well, I think that's a, that's a wrap on everything. Bumper episodes to make sure you catch up. We're changing tack next week. We're doing some facial aesthetics. So uh, I'll catch you on that. Who's um, that? But, uh, Zainab. Oh, she's oh, great. Nice. Oh. She's done to, we might have a special guest for that as well because I quite like having two people Ooh. down there. It's quite fun. <laughs> it just feels slightly less intimidating. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I like it. Thanks so much for having us. Pleasure. Stu, nice thanks for popping on. I know you had a late day. Um, and Fran, yeah, <laughs> awesome stuff. You didn't have to worry at all. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, guys. See you soon. Take Cheers. care. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.